Hello, my name is Lisa Curtis, and I'm the director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program here at the Center for a New American Security. Thank you for joining our event today as we present our new paper, India-China Border Tensions and U.S. Strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Border intrusions and clashes along the disputed India-China border have become more frequent in recent years and threaten to lead to all-out conflict. In recent years, China has been more assertive with its territorial claims and has been increasing infrastructure development and military deployments along the border and periodically in roaches onto territory controlled by India. The first deadly border clash between the two countries in 45 years occurred on June 15, 2020 in the Gawan River Valley, where 20 Indian soldiers and at least four Chinese PLA forces were killed in a hand-to-hand -hand brawl. More recently, on December 9, 2022, Chinese and Indian forces clashed along the disputed border in the mountains near Tawang, which is in the, the northeastern Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh. And this happened after an estimated 300 Chinese PLA soldiers tried to cross the border. Fortunately, no one was killed in that flare-up. While the Chinese and Indian militaries have since pulled back forces from the most contentious standoff sites where the 2020 Chinese military buildup occurred, both sides retain high numbers of troops along the frontier, and there are several flashpoints that could erupt into another crisis at any time. Well, here to talk about this further and to provide our keynote remarks today, we are honored to have with us Senator Jeff Merkley from Oregon. By way of background, Senator Merkley entered the Oregon House of Representatives in 1998, and he became Speaker of the House in 2007. In both, in both the Oregon House of Representatives and in the U.S. Senate, Senator Merkley has championed working families, and he fights to create living wage jobs. He works to make college more affordable for students and retirement more secure for seniors. Senator Merkley serves on the Senate Committees on Appropriations, Environment and Public Works, Budget and Foreign Relations. He also serves as the co-chair of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. In February, he introduced a bipartisan resolution reaffirming U.S. recognition of the state of Arunachal Pradesh as an integral part of India and condemning China's use of military force to try to change the territorial status quo along the line of actual control or the de facto border between the two countries. We are absolutely honored to have you with us, Senator Merkley. Please, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. And thank you to the Center for New American Security for the invitation to share a few remarks. As it is almost always the case, we find ourselves in a dangerous moment in international affairs. Authoritarianism is on the rise, while the fundamental institutions of democracy are threatened in country after country. We certainly see the dangerous moment in the Ukrainian people's valiant defense of their homeland against Russia's invasion. We see it in other ways, in waning checks on the abuses of power, blatant violations of human rights and freedom of speech, and the rise and strengthening of uh, strongman leaders. And we see it in the Chinese Communist government's aggressive and expansionist policies that are threatening the peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region, including China's aggression into India's state of Arunachal Pradesh this past December. And of course, that's the topic that you're all gathered to talk about. And so to address that, we certainly see China regularly probing and testing to see how far they can push along that line of actual control, that 20 hundred mile de facto border between the two countries. And this, this past December, India forces pushed back and they did so with actionable intelligence and support from the United States as a result of the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement on Geospatial Cooperation, or BECA, that our two nations agreed to back in 2020. America could see what the Chinese were up to, help communicate it to the Indian forces, and provide it in a way that uh, India could act on it and stop the PLA troops from seizing a new foothold across that line. 
and this is the type of cooperation, and coordination, and partnership appropriate to support India in responding to Chinese provocations. Because we all know that our Arunachal Pradesh wasn't an isolated incident. We know the Chinese Communist Party is constantly using its military forces to try to change the status quo along the line of actual control. That they are building villages in contested areas. That they are publishing maps showing Indian territory with Mandarin names for cities and features. And that aggression and incursions will continue unless they're given a reason to stop. And that's what the Indian forces did in December. To show our support for India in defending their territories against Chinese violations of India's sovereignty, I introduced the resolution that Lisa referred to with Senator Haggerty of uh, Tennessee. Our resolution makes clear that the Senate recognizes the state of Arunachal Pradesh as an integral part of the Republic of India and supports India's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It condemns the People's Republic of China's use of military force to change the status quo along the line of actual control. It commends the Indian government for taking steps to defend itself against aggression and security threats from the People's Republic of China, including through securing its telecommunications infrastructure, examining its procurement processes and supply chains, and implementing investment screening standards. It applauds the government of India for increasing its development efforts in our Arunachal Pradesh, including for improving border infrastructure and connectivity and renewable energy production. And it commits to deepening the United States assistance to the region, including through the Department of State and USAIDs, using funding mechanisms such as the Counter NPRC Influence Fund. And it encourages like-minded international partners to join in supporting India and commits us to strengthening the U.S.-India bilateral partnership through enhanced defense interoperability and information sharing and economic cooperation. So that's quite a bit. It also makes notice of the role of uh, ASEAN and the role of the Quad in supporting India in, in responding to Chinese aggression throughout the, the region. This uh, reevaluation of support for India comes as India has been stepping up their leadership in the Indo-Pacific from hosting the recent G20 summit with Secretary Blinken and other foreign ministers. It comes as India has been increasing their participation in the Quad with US, Japan, and Australia. It is, of course, the case that in the context of international affairs, there are areas where we'd like to see India take a stronger stand. And I think it bears mentioning that that is particularly the case in regard to Russia. I would like to see India, as a democratic republic, take a strong stand against Putin's unwarranted and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. I'd like to see them stop buying oil from Russia. And those purchases help sustain Russia's economy and ability to sustain its assault in Ukraine. I'd like to see them join the international sanctions, which are obviously more effective if India participates. I'd like them to bring a stronger voice to the international stage in condemning the Russian invasion. And I do have to confess, I have a, a special place in my heart for, for India. Uh, in, time I was in graduate school, I, I served as an intern over the summer uh, with uh, the U.S. State Department uh, operating out of New Delhi. At a time we did not have an ambassador there, India was very committed to the non-aligned movement. My wife uh, has spent uh, many months working in India as well, so we've always felt, felt a special connection and were able to go back a, a few years ago for a series of, of meetings. And so I just thought I'd share that as, as well as the perspectives that I'm, I'm bringing from having spent uh, years uh, working uh, with Cap Weinberger, Secretary of Defense under the Reagan administration. And now here in Congress, my perspectives are shaped in part as co-chair of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. It has given me a front row seat on China's activities on the world stage. I've hosted hearings that have examined China's devastation of Hong Kong's political rights. China's enslavement of the Uyghur population, China's use of high technology to create an all-encompassing surveillance state that, that if you were reading about it 20 years ago would have felt like science fiction in some far future world. China's determination to erase the culture 
and um, kind of usurp the religion of Tibet. And just this week, we were holding hearings that emphasize that impact on, on Tibet, including essentially the uh, effort to interrupt the transmission of culture from generation to generation with 80% of Tibetan children being taken away from their parents at the start of grade school to attend boarding schools and essentially be programmed uh, in a very different sense of uh, Tibet uh, and uh, the future of Tibet. And as part of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I've seen China's preparation for the potential use of military power against Taiwan, their expansion of control in the South China Sea, and as you all are very familiar with, a whole series of tactics flexing the Chinese uh, international uh, muscles. And just recently, we all bore witness to the three-day bro fest with Xi and Putin celebrating authoritarian power. In two weeks, I'll be leading a congressional delegation to Southeast Asia, including discussions in Jakarta regarding ASEAN and uh, the role of ASEAN in resisting Chinese aggression. And we need to continue to work to strengthen our relationship with the Quad. And only by working together, strengthening our international partnerships, can we help enhance the sovereignty and security of nations in the region. So thank you everyone at the Center for New American Security for your work and your focus on growing challenges in this part of the world. There is no question that uh, those challenges are daunting. Uh, but by analyzing them carefully and building uh, partnerships and relationships to respond, we will have the best possible ability to uh, build a more secure world, a more prosperous world. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Merkley. That was an extraordinary and powerful statement uh, about your important resolution, about the work you're doing on the China Executive Congressional Commission, uh, the importance of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership, um, just really uh, important remarks. And we thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the second part of our program in which I and my co-author Derek Grossman are going to spend a few minutes discussing the findings and policy recommendations of our report. Uh, but first, let me just give a brief history of the India-China border dispute. Um, India and China went to war in 1962 after China had launched simultaneous attacks against Indian positions in both the eastern and western sectors of their disputed borders. And after only a few weeks, it was clear that Beijing had significantly defeated New Delhi. Um, China declared a unilateral ceasefire. It annexed the land it had captured in the western sector, which is called the Aksai Chin region, and it retreated from the area it had taken in the eastern sector, which is Tawang, which is located in what is now the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, and Beijing and New Delhi agreed to a de facto boundary that emerged around uh, a line of actual control, which to this day remains undemarcated. From the late 1980s until 2013, the China-India border remained relatively peaceful. Uh, the two sides engaged in sporadic talks came to several agreements, um, and they both seemed to recognize the need for confidence building measures, and they focused on other areas of the relationship like trade and investment, and the border remained largely quiet. In 2013, things changed, perhaps in part due to Chinese President Xi Jinping's ascension to power. China started to take proactive actions along the line of actual control. For example, in 2013, Chinese troops camped for three weeks, several miles inside Indian territory on the Depsang Plains region in Ladakh. The next border standoff occurred 18 months later in September 2014, shortly after uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had come to power in India. And this happened during President Xi's visit to India to meet with Modi. Um, yet another lengthy border standoff occurred in the summer of 2017 in the Bhutan-China-India tri-border area in Doklam. Uh, 
Um, I've already mentioned China's 2020 military buildup along the LAC that led to the deadly clash in the Gaowan Valley. And the rationale for China's military buildup along the LAC in 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic um, is still largely unknown. But I think one thing is certain, uh, that 2020 border crisis has completely shifted India's approach to its relations with China. Since then, India has become more receptive to quad cooperation and has even invited Australia to participate in its annual Malabar naval exercise, along with Japan and the United States. India also is fortifying its own infrastructure along the border and strengthening its military capacity and capabilities to meet any potential future threats from China along the lines of what happened in 2020. And although they have de-escalated the border situation at most friction points uh, where this 2020 buildup occurred, uh, India refuses to normalize bilateral ties until China moves back to pre-2020 border positions at all points along the LAC. So why this increase in Chinese border provocations in the last decade? The predominant reason may be China's confidence in its growing military and economic strength, which is leading to uh, assertiveness regarding its territorial ambitions. Many Indian officials believe China is trying to contain India by forcing it to divert more and more resources into defending simultaneously both its western border with Pakistan and its eastern flank with China, and trying to weaken its willingness and ability to challenge Chinese ambitions to dominate the region. But it may also be a Chinese reaction to strengthening India-US ties. Uh, it may be China signaling India not to get too close to the United States. Unfortunately, prospects for negotiating a political settlement between the two countries remains low. China is not interested in clarifying the LAC through a map exchange as India has suggested. And this is likely because China believes it holds the military advantage and it wants to use the border friction to uh, needle India and put pressure on New Delhi. In the past, China had signaled an interest in a territorial swap in which India would drop its claims on the Aksai Chin in exchange for China dropping its claims on Arunachal Pradesh. However, China has since backed away from that offer uh, several years ago. The border agreements that were signed between China and India between 1993 and 2013 are unfortunately becoming increasingly irrelevant. The 2020 border crisis has led to really a complete breakdown in trust between the two countries, um, rendering those previous agreements nearly useless. For instance, the Chinese used the tactic of shooting guns into the air on at least two occasions in the past three years. Prior to 2020, both sides had respected the agreed protocol that no firearms would be used along the border. So with that, I want to turn the floor over to my co-author, Derek Grossman, who will discuss the policy implications of ongoing India-China border tensions and tell you about some of our policy recommendations. Derek is a senior defense analyst at the RAND Corporation, where he closely tracks U.S.-China competition throughout the Indo-Pacific. Before he joined RAND, he served over a decade in the intelligence community, where he was the daily intelligence briefer to the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia and Pacific Security Affairs. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California. Derek, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks, CNAS, for hosting this uh, rollout event. I'm really proud of the work that we did, uh, and I hope everybody gets a chance to read the full report. Um, and that was great, a uh, great setup, uh, what you just did for, for me to uh, discuss some of the implications of our research as well as some of the policy recommendations. So on the implications, the chances of India-China conflict are increasing. 
as each country pursues its growing interests in the region and becomes more sensitive to the other's activities along the LAC. And one implication of intensifying border friction between New Delhi and Beijing is a further hardening of New Delhi's position on China and a corresponding deepening of its partnership with the United States. Uh, developments along the LAC in 2020 have brought clarity to India's strategic approach toward China, meaning that India's views of the China challenge are starting to converge with those of the United States, even if the strategies for dealing with the challenge differ in several respects. I think a second implication uh, is that the hardening of the Indian position on China could facilitate Washington's integrated deterrence strategy. In the Indo-Pacific, the Biden administration seems to be prioritizing deterrence by denial, uh, most clearly highlighted by continued security support to Taiwan uh, as a key to preventing China from resorting to military operations in the future. And this suggests that the U.S. might want to open or deepen discussions with New Delhi on the most effective ways to deter Beijing by denial, keeping in mind the inherent limitations of such a strategy. A third implication is that from a broader perspective, renewed Chinese assertiveness along the LAC is likely to further convince other Chinese neighbors that are cautious about security cooperation with Washington that closer security ties with the United States would be beneficial to their national security. However, if Washington extends support to India that helps it to deter Chinese aggression, other nations may begin to calculate that strengthening ties with the US is, more of, is a more effective way to protect their territorial sovereignty than placating China. A fourth implication is that renewed China-India uh, tensions or armed conflict at the border also would result in newfound challenges for the US. Short of nuclear war, a sustained crisis or war along the LAC could force the US to redirect military and other resources to the region. And lastly, given the need to prevent uh, a border crisis from, from flaring in the first place, there is a need to better understand Chinese motives for its actions along its disputed borders with India. None of the explanations out there, and, and Lisa went through a few of them, whether related to India rejoining the Quad or, Mod's, or, or Modi's uh, Article 370 announcement in 2019, uh, among others, none of those explanations have been substantiated as the reason why China is you know, being more assertive right now along the LAC. So in, a few, in the future, a deeper examination of Chinese motives, I think, would be helpful. And then turning briefly to our policy recommendations. So we have a number of them. So uh, one is we as the United States should consider elevating Indian territorial disputes with China on par with Beijing's assertiveness against other U.S. allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific and ensure that this is reflected in all national security related documents and speeches. To date, only the Biden administration's national defense strategy mentions uh, the China-India uh, border issue briefly without any real elaboration on U.S. policy. And by the way, the, the national security strategy doesn't mention it at all. Uh, in the future, every authoritative uh, U.S. statement should mention the border dispute while making it clear that Washington supports maintaining the territorial status quo between New Delhi and Beijing. A second recommendation from us is that we should offer India sophisticated military technology uh, that it requires to defend its borders and initiate co-production and co-development of military equipment. While total U.S. military sales have increased over $20 billion in the last 15 years, India has not made a major military purchase from the U.S. since uh, the $3.5 billion helicopter deal signed uh, during the Trump administration in February of 2020. To help bolster U.S.-India defense trade and improve Indian capabilities over the long term, Washington might consider the, mo the most sophisticated technology as part of its defense deals. Um, Washington also must incentivize U.S. private companies to co-develop and co-produce high-tech military equipment in India. A third recommendation is we should assist India in strengthening its maritime and naval capacity, helping India improve its maritime and naval capabilities, will enable India to remain a dominant maritime power in the Indian Ocean region at a time when China is making new inroads into the, uh, into the Indian Ocean. Uh, I think this is important because it kind of takes India's, uh, um, or it takes China's, um, it reduces China's bandwidth to continue to push the issue along the LAC and opens up uh, a new front uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, fourth, we should conduct joint intelligence reviews with India to align assessments of Chinese plans and intentions along the LAC and enhance coordination with Indian officials on contingency planning in the event of a renewed uh, India-China uh, conflict. Um, this could take, you know, the the the, the form of uh, conducting regular joint intelligence reviews, 
uh, wargaming exercises, and also developing joint contingency plans. Fifth, we should establish or support an official or unofficial organization charged with collating unclassified commercial satellite imagery on the position of PLA troops along the LAC and disseminate these images routinely for public consumption. This capability would provide clarity on what is transpiring in a remote part of the world and put pressure on China to improve its behavior. Uh, a seventh recommendation is we should criticize Beijing's efforts at land grabbing in multilateral fora, including not just at the United Nations, but in others like the Shangri-La Dialogue, the G20 Summit, the East Asia Summit, and others. Obviously, India might have a little bit of heartburn, especially it's, because it's hosting the G20 this, uh, this September at the leadership level. Uh, so they may prefer us to be a little bit more generic, not to call out the LAC in particular, uh, but to just call out, uh, for example, China's land border law that was passed in 2021 as being in contravention of international law and norms of behavior. Uh, eighth, we should message Pakistan, one of uh, one of our longstanding partners, uh, that you know that they should not consider opening a second front if there ever is another uh, China-India uh, military clash. Uh, uh, and then finally, we should be prepared to extend full support to India in the event of another border crisis or conflict. Um, what we should be prepared to support India with intelligence and information sharing uh, that will help India to bolster its defense and expedite the provision of military items that will enhance Indian ISR and missile and air defense capabilities. And we should also finally be prepared for operational planning to support India as requested. So I look forward to uh, the panelists uh, discussing our paper and any Q&A that might come up thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, hopefully that has whetted everyone's appetite to actually read the report, um, because I promise you, even though we uh, have given you a lot from it, there there is still a lot in it that we were unable to uh, provide in this limited time frame. Um, next, uh, we will have an expert panel uh, to discuss their thoughts on the paper and India-China border tensions in general. Uh, we have an excellent expert panel uh, with us. We have first, Dr. Taylor Fravel. Uh, Dr. Fravel is the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science and Director of the Security Studies Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, Taylor focuses on international security, China, and East Asia. His books include Strong Borders, Secure Nation, Cooperation and Conflict in China's Territorial Disputes, uh, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2008, and Active Defense, China's Military Strategy Since 1949, also published by Princeton University Press in 2019. Uh, Taylor is a graduate of Middlebury College and Stanford University, where he received his PhD. He also has graduate degrees from the London School of Economics and Oxford University, where he was actually a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, next, we will have Dr. Aparna Pandey. Uh, Dr. Pandey is a research fellow at the Hudson Institute. Her major field of interest is South Asia, with a special focus on India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Foreign Policy and Security. A 1993 graduate of Delhi University, Dr. Pandey holds an MA in History and a Master of Philosophy in International Relations from Nehru University. Dr. Pandey received a doctorate in Political Science from Boston University in 2010. Her books include Explaining Pakistan's Foreign Policy, Escaping India, which was published by Rutledge in 2011 and From Chanakya to Modi, Evolution of India's Foreign Policy, published by HarperCollins in 2017, and, and Making India Great, The Promise of a Reluctant Global Power by HarperCollins in 2020. Obviously, Dr. Pandey has been extremely prolific in the last few years. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Dave Shulman, who is the Senior Director of the Global China Hub at the Atlantic Council. Uh, prior to joining the Council, um, Dave was senior advisor at the International Republican Institute, where he oversaw the Institute's work on building the resilience of democratic institutions around the world uh, against the influence of China, Russia, and other aut autocracies. David served for nearly a dozen years as one of the U.S. government's top experts on East Asia, most re recently as the Deputy National Intelligence Officer for East Asia on the National Intelligence Council. 
He earned his PhD in political science from UCLA, an MALD from the Fletcher School, and a BA from Georgetown. So uh, we're going to hear first from Dr. Fravel. Uh, please, the floor is yours, Dr. Fravel. You're on mute. Hi, thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, muting and unmuting uh, the story of our times. Um, anyway, thank you so much for having me today. It's a real pleasure uh, to join the conversation and I'm delighted uh, to comment on your excellent uh, report with Derek, uh, with my fellow uh, panelists. I'll try to make five uh, quick points uh, that seek to sort of engage uh, the report and some of the findings. Um, so the first has to do with the status quo. So the report argues, right, that US policy should be made, sort of focused on maintaining the territorial status quo. But this raises a question, what is it exactly, right? It might appear to be the line of actual control, but in 23 places, China and India don't agree about the location of the line of the actual control. And the amount of territory, right, that this includes where disagreements over the LAC exist are at least a thousand square kilometers, if not larger. I sort of call this the dispute within the disputes, uh, but this is really where much of the action is, is, is being driven. Tensions in the past decade right, have been driven uh, by changes in each side's ability to access and patrol these areas where their views of, of the line of actual control uh, differ. And in fact, this is probably what contributes uh, significantly, at least in my estimation, to sort of Chinese concerns about um, Indian uh, actions, uh, going on to the point about what's sort of motivating China. So if the US policy right, is going to be grounded, grounded on the status quo, should the United States take a position on whose interpretation represents the status quo? That would be tricky, uh, especially in the Western sector, where the US still seeks to maintain a position of neutrality uh, in terms of the actual territorial dispute situation with the McMahon line uh, in the Eastern sector is different. Moreover, it's actually hard to evaluate, right? In some places, what each side views of the LAC lies beyond areas they've even accessed on a regular basis, right? Um, so bottom line, right, my first point here, this is a complex interactive dispute. It's not so straightforward, but it has implications for what we mean by pursuing a strategy of deterrence by denial. Is it to deny China to go beyond India's view of the LAC in these areas where it differs? Is it to deny China the ability to go beyond its view of the LAC where uh, these perceptions differ and so forth? Where there's a shared perception, I think it's more straightforward. But again, I think the reason why we've seen tensions in the past few years has to do with these areas where the view of the LAC differ. So my second point um, just reflects briefly here on what is motivating China. I've written a lot about this, so I guess to me, uh, it's not so puzzling um, necessarily. Uh, I tend to apply Occam's razor in, in the context of studying China, its territorial disputes, which is that usually its first or prime driver has to do with its assessment of what other states are doing in the dispute, and what that means uh, for its own sovereignty. Uh, it, it may view itself as acting defensively, even though many times these actions are actually offensive. And so I'm not trying to sort of make a judgment here, but if we're trying to understand I think what motivates China, what has motivated China in the last decade. Um, I think I would point to uh, several turning points in addition to the point that Lisa made about enhanced kind of Chinese capabilities. But first, right, both sides have been able to uh, establish a much greater presence very near or on the LAC itself uh, through uh, infrastructure enhancements. They have much more uh, agile and mobile forces than before. And so they've been able to patrol much more frequently especially in the last five to six years. And this comes out of Indian uh, statements as well as uh, sort of observations of Chinese behavior, areas that were patrolled you know, once a month or once a week can now be patrolled once a day. And of course that creates um, a sort of a dynamic in which uh, concerns about or, 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 or concerns about whose line of, or whose perception of the line of actual control is being violated when, when they disagree become much more salient. So this is why I've, I think we've seen sort of an escalation of tensions. From China's standpoint, uh, India's role uh, in 2017 was clearly a turning point because India moved troops uh, across the international frontier into a territory disputed by China and Bhutan. Uh, and I think that shaped Chinese perceptions as to how um, India was gonna behave in lots of other areas where there may also uh, be, be disagreements. And I think 2019 with Article 370 was absolutely a critical turning point, and we have pretty good uh, evidence from that time that China was sort of quite uh, seized with this. And so um, I'll come back to this point in a minute, but I think essentially what China is trying to do, right, is to stabilize uh, the line of actual control to its favor 
uh, in these areas where it uh, sees itself as facing kind of increasing uh, challenges from India, which have been kind of a natural consequence of force uh, modernization and the infrastructure efforts. Third point has to on sort of the main theme of the report uh, for the United States to bolster deterrence. I mean, I think overall this is a good idea, but but it's not always entirely straightforward, right? So uh, it raises just a couple of questions, that I'll, although I don't have the answers uh, to most of them. But I, would, would this actually deter China more or would it lead China to double down, right? On the one hand, China wants to mend ties with India. Um, on the other hand, uh, it would not want to be seen as kind of bowing uh, to U.S. pressure and thus have, from its standpoint, greater incentives to resist, especially because the U.S. would become more involved in another sovereignty and territorial dispute um, in which China has claims, right, if and when China is not deterred. Um, in fact, one could argue, right, that deepening U.S.-China-India ties overall but actually placing the territorial dispute in the background and perhaps a very quiet cooperation on the intelligence front that has been very successful might be more uh, effective than putting the territorial dispute itself uh, front and center, right? This would, China might actually be more concerned about weakening that relationship and actually might become more moderate in some areas uh, on the border. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through the rest of the questions I had here, but I want to go to my fourth point, which has to do with the maritime domain. I think there's a bigger strategic issue on the table. And the report, or one of the recommendations about enhancing kind of maritime cooperation gets to this. But I think from a strategic standpoint, right, the China-India border dispute is not the most important element for U.S. policy in the Indo-Pacific as it relates to India. Right. It is definitely, uh, in my my view, uh, the maritime domain, and Arzon Terrapur has made this point forcefully. So um, it's certainly not my my view alone. But I think one risk in, in sort of some of the proposals that the report contains might actually have the outcome of fixing India even more on focusing on on the border dispute at the expense of uh, strengthening its maritime uh, capabilities and its maritime power which in the longer run, I think are gonna be much more uh, consequential uh, in terms of uh, cooperation uh, with respect to China and an area where China clearly wants to make uh, much uh, greater gains. And so I think um, if we think about this in a different way, like a stabilized border, because the underlying disputes between China and India are not gonna be solved in the near term. China did offer a package deal. It's important to note that India rejected the package deal. Uh, and now the two sides are, going to engage in sector-specific negotiations, which they're each going to have sort of additional claims that will make a final resolution even more unlikely. So I think the best sort of realistic outcome here, right, is a stabilized border that allows uh, India to focus uh, more on the maritime domain and allows U.S.-India uh, cooperation uh, to focus more on the maritime domain. So fifth and last point here to sum up, I would add an, an additional recommendation, right, that in addition to deterrence, uh, the U.S. also consider Facilitate, facilitating some aspects of diplomacy that can help stabilize the border. As Lisa noted, the original CBMs are now 30 years old. They were, they're completely out of date and irrelevant. I mean, they were written at a time when neither side could actually really reach the LAC. And no one, no, it's not even clear at the time where either side really believed it to be, um, um, but they, they could, you know, reality is in the ground, military modernization, forced modernization, and infrastructure enhancements on both sides right, have, have, have meant that we're in a new world. And so those CBMs need to be, I think, discarded and, and new kinds of agreements uh, need to be considered. Uh, the disengagement agree agreements that have been reached around Pongo Lake and some other areas uh, in uh, the Western um, sector, I think have merit uh, that are worth uh, exploring more uh, because if one could actually reduce uh, patrols into areas where the two sides disagree about uh, the location of the LAC, they might act, it might have the effect, right, of actually bringing more stability uh, to, to the border. If that can be consolidated in some way, I think it would actually be beneficial from a broader strategic perspective in terms of focusing uh, more on uh, the maritime domain. Also, I think in the course of doing so, right, each side would give up something that it wants, uh, and that actually is often the basis for um, an agreement that's in some kind of equilibrium. And so I would add that as, as an additional recommendation to consider. Uh, thanks again, uh, Lisa and Derek. Um, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to be here today. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Taylor. Those were excellent remarks, really interesting perspective. Your idea that uh, China, in fact, may 
feel it is acting defensively when both sides are patrolling more, building up more infrastructure. You know, is China, as you said, actually trying to stabilize the LAC, of course, in its favor? Um, but I think you asked, does China want to mend ties to India or, you know, that is that a goal? But I guess it's on what terms? Um, because there's some question, is it trying to change facts on the ground and then force India to accept the new facts on the ground? So that that's something that um, I think we can have uh, more discussion on. Um, I could I have so many more comments, but I, I will save it because I want to hear from our other experts. Um, next, we'll turn to Dr. Pandey. Good morning. I'd um, like to thank, start by thanking Center for New American Security and Lisa for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, pleasure to be on a panel with distinguished speakers. Um, I must commend Derek and Lisa for an excellent report, uh, detailed uh, and very timely. Um, I have three thoughts, but before I go into the report, uh, just one broad um, comment. Um, I've lived in this country for almost two decades now, and one of the things I have noticed is an overwhelming desire among American policymakers to tell other countries what they should do, why changing their strategic calculus would be beneficial, or why they should not adopt this or that policy. Um, countries, unfortunately or fortunately, have their own strategic calculus. And the reason why country X does what it does, or how it views its position in the world, or what it perceives is in its own interest, however they are defined. Um, I have three quick thoughts on the report. First. Uh, the report lists right up front what the authors would like the United States to do, and Derek laid them out earlier, uh, to help India. But I would be equally interested in whether the authors have thought about what India would need to do for each of those things to happen. Uh, for each of the policy recommendations, for each of the suggestions, what would the Indian side need to do uh, so that the United States, so that the U.S. can either offer or the U.S. can follow through um, whether it's that independent entity which will share data or whether it's the U.S. government offering more military or the latest technology, what does the Indian side need to do? Um, second, it is true that the U.S. government over the decades invested a lot in building mechanisms to deal with the India-Pakistan crisis and not so much on the India-China side. However, and, and I believe Lisa knows this firsthand quite well, American ability was limited by the politics of both India and Pakistan. Further, despite billions in economic and security assistance to Pakistan, the U.S. was unable to convince Pakistan to abandon its use of uh, subconventional warfare um, under a nuclear umbrella. Therefore, it may be useful for the authors to delve deeper into how the United States might be able to manage crises between China and India. I suspect that American options will be limited in this regard by America's recognition of China as a peer rival and of India as a strategic partner. India, on the other hand, has never accepted a third party role, either intervention or mediation in bilateral disputes. Uh, finally, the report appears to imply that India has completely changed its views on China. Um, it is accurate that India viewed China as a threat, even when the United States and its allies did not view China as a threat during the Cold War. Um, India has often spoken of the potential of a two-front war in the context of Sino-Pakistani collaboration going back decades now. I agree that as of now, there's little chance of a Wuhan or Mamalapuram-style high-level high summit diplomacy. On the other hand, 2023 is the year of India and India, and Delhi does not want any clash on the India-China border, taking the shine away from um, the Indian halo right now. However, once the 2024 elections are over, if the current uh, government comes back with a majority, one cannot really rule out um, any high-level or backdoor uh, engagements so as to reduce the tensions on the India-China border. Um, Happy to discuss further, but um, I'll stop by saying once again, an excellent report and look forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Aparna. Also some great uh, food for thought there um, and great comments. Um, and, uh, you know, I agree with you. You're right that the U.S. in the India-Pakistan dispute <clears throat> was never able to convince Pakistan to 
uh, completely abandon its reliance on militants, um, demonstrating that uh, there are limits to U.S. influence. Uh, would agree with you on that. Um, next, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Dave Shulman. Dave. Great. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks to, to CNS for having me. Uh, congrats to you and Derek on a, on a truly great paper, as everyone has been saying. Um, and it's an honor to be on this panel with Aparna and Taylor, who've thrown out already a lot of great ideas. Uh, so I'll try to add with uh, some stray thoughts, which fall into three general buckets. Uh, first, on the drivers of China's approach to the dispute, uh, and in particular, the role of internal insecurity as a motive. Uh, second, on China's narrative on the dispute and how it fits into China's broader foreign policy messaging right now. And then a bit uh, on U.S. policy to close. Um, so first, uh, in terms of China's motivations regarding the dispute, which, which we've discussed already and which uh, I think everyone has agreed it are still a bit hazy, and that was underscored in the report, and Taylor touched on this. Um, you know, the paper addresses the confluence of factors that have led uh, to, to China's approach uh, to the border. It's more aggressive approach more recently in the past several years and comes down with the judgment that the predominant cause is China's confidence in its growing military and economic strength. And I think that's right. Uh, I believe the probable guidance from Xi to the PLA to more aggressively and proactively seek advantage at the border is the primary cause of the uptick in China's aggressive moves. But I also want to underscore the role of China's internal dynamics, uh, and in particular the drive to ensure control in Tibet and its western region more generally, and the fears of instability and how that dynamic has historically driven China's turn toward herd aligned positions and aggression, and how all of this relates to Xi's current obsession with security and mitigating uh, internal and external vulnerabilities. So if I could start just briefly with a, with a historical detour, the paper notes that in the late 70s, once Deng Xiaoping had consolidated power in the wake of Mao's death, China made fresh overtures toward India, proposed this package deal to resolve the dispute in which China would give up its claim to Arunachal Pradesh in exchange for India ceding its claim on the Aksai Chin. The paper notes the offer was a result of the deep freeze in Soviet PRC relations at that time and was rescinded by the late 80s. My research seems to indicate that it was actually rescinded earlier than that, uh, well before the 86-87 Sundar Chu standoff, before unrest in Tibet started growing in the mid-80s in 85 and 86, um, and consistent with the fact that the PRC's concern over control in Tibet has been really central to China's approach to the border going back to the 50s and in the lead up to the 1962 war, and this has been well documented. And I think all of this is important because there are lessons here about balancing this international external driver approach to China's behavior with a fulsome understanding of what's happening inside China when we think about China's motivations. So China's willingness post Mao to reach out to India to try to weaken Delhi's bonds to Moscow was indeed a driver of the package deal offer. But another permissive factor was that concern over Tibet was relatively minimal at the time. Uh, this, uh, not to get too deep into it, but this was around the time that General Secretary Hu Yaobang was promoting a CCP review of Tibet policy and conducting outreach to Tibet culminating in his visit to Lhasa in 1980. And so that limiting factor was not there. And once you have growing unrest in Tibet in the mid 80s, you get a tougher Chinese approach to uh, Tibet and to the border. And that contributes to the standoff that begins in 1986. And a similar dynamic plays out 20 years later when we go from arguably the high water mark in productive border negotiations in 2005 to a much more aggressive uh, rhetoric on the border out of China in 2006 as unrest in Tibet again ramps up eventually leading to China's crackdown uh, in Tibet in March 2008. So this history has continued relevance today in Xi's China, where it's hard to overstate the overriding party concern about security, both internal and external. Um, much of it is centered on a protracted geopolitical struggle with the United States and our allies, and this was underscored at the 20th Party Congress in, in Xi's speech there, where he uh, underscored security at every turn. He did this again at the two meetings uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and if you were to conceive of a sort of nightmare scenario for PRC planners, you have a U.S. intent upon using every tool at its disposal in a future conflict with China, most likely over Taiwan, where the U.S. would seek to not only divide Beijing's attention from the South China Sea through encouraging simultaneous engagement at the Indian border and potentially elsewhere, but would also look to instigate some sort of internal instability in the rest of Western regions, where China has been, as has been mentioned, ramping up its draconian, draconian controls, not only in Xinjiang, uh, where we know China has been prosecuting a genocide, uh, but also in Tibet, uh, which gets less attention these days, but where Beijing is also carrying out a forced assimilation campaign, as Senator Merkley pointed out. So all of this relates to what the paper flags as a real need to better understand China's motives for its actions along the border, uh, 
which can help develop better indicators and warning about future Chinese aggressive action. Um, it's increasingly widely believed, as the paper notes, that, that China's aggression, including in 2020 at Galwan, is designed to strategically pressure India to back away from its growing security ties with the U.S. Uh, that's consistent with a broader sense that China's tougher line at the border after 2006 would, was driven by India's closer relationship to the United States, uh, beginning with the civil nuclear deal, which I think is definitely an enabling factor. But I think it's important to weigh these factors internal to China and I believe the related general directive to the PLA to proactively enhance China's position relative to India along the border, which has gone into overdrive under Xi, as well as some more tactical motivations uh, that the paper references, such as the PLA reacting to India's completion of a road leading to a remote airfield on the border of Baksai Chin. So that's number one. Uh, second, I think it's instructive uh, to put China's narrative on the border dispute in the context of its broader foreign policy strategy and messaging currently, and in particular, how it sits alongside Beijing's push to portray itself as a responsible global player and a peacemaker. And we've seen that most recently in this supposed peace plan uh, that China has raised uh, around um, the, the Ukraine war, uh, China's brokering of a rapprochement, uh, initial rapprochement between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and even it, pushing all of these notions that China is kind of this, this peacemaker responsible player, even as it uses force or the threat of force to achieve its territorial ambitions. Um, China's messaging on the border clashes, both at the official level and in the in official media, uh, tend to not only blame India, which is not surprising, and China does the same in its other disputes, but also to generally downplay the incidents and their scale and intensity, focusing on their resolution while not offering to back away from territorial gains achieved through force, and then calling on the Indian side to work together for peace and then to move on and focus on other aspects of the relationship and common interests and then blaming Indian leaders for being unwilling to just place the border to one side. Um, and we saw that again earlier this month with, uh, with External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar's meeting uh, with the new Chinese foreign minister. There's some clear parallels here with China's approach, not only to its other territorial disputes, but also to its messaging and diplomacy around Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where China papers over the important detail of who initiated aggression and the territorial gains that have resulted at the cost of another country to then self-servingly shift the focus uh, to returning to negotiations and paint itself as a force for peace uh, and the victim or the supporters of the victim as irrationally focused on rectifying the illegal action taken in the first place. So there's a pattern here of China using or supporting the use of military force to suit its interests and then proactively shaping the narrative to portray itself as a force for peace and ceasefires. And what's remarkable is that this messaging is actually more effective with some key audiences than one might expect. So it's something for the US to take into account if in fact we do dedicate more effort to raising awareness of China's actions, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, another element of China's narrative approach is how often China flips the causality in terms of the mounting standoffs at the border initiated by China on the one hand, and India's growing alignment with the United States, with Chinese officials and academics couching, in, in, with China's uh, officials and academics couching India's focus on the border dispute and tougher line on China as somehow a result of India's closer ties with the U.S. rather than the other way around. So in this story, it's Washington's machinations, which have somehow duped India into adopting what the Chinese would term an outdated bloc mindset uh, to relations with India, rather than China's aggression being more than sufficient to shift Indian perceptions of China's intentions on its own. And again, this is a common element in China's foreign policy messaging and thinking in other areas, where relations with countries that uh, are partnered with the United States are viewed through that U.S.-China framework. This applies to Japan, to Australia, to European countries, none of which are assumed to have sufficient agency of their own to have independently decided based upon demonstrated Chinese proclivity for coercion and aggression that their own interests are better served by a more circumspect approach to engagement uh, with China. Um, lastly, uh, on U.S. policy and public diplomacy in particular, I agree with the recommendations um, in the paper, particularly on stepping up provision of military equipment and technology and intelligence to help India's defenses and awareness at the border and to be prepared to extend full support to India. Um, one point I was going to make, but which Taylor covered better than I, than I ever could, is that the maritime domain and competition in the Indian Ocean region, I think, is the main game here. So we need to take seriously his point about inadvertently detracting from India's focus there in a world of finite resources. I think it gets a little tricky when we move to the messaging and public diplomacy space. There are a lot of reasons which this paper does a good job of addressing um, why this is tricky, but it comes down to the difficulty of threading the needle between, on the one hand, being clear about the U.S. elevating the border dispute to the same level as other territorial issues with China in East Asia, 
And the report notes, you know, as, as Derek just went over, every authoritative U.S. statement should mention the dispute. We should raise it at all these multilateral fora, um, which could engender greater Indian trust in the United States. And on the other hand, not drawing the dispute into the downhill, downhill spiral that we're watching in U.S.-China relations or appearing to violate India's desire to remain independent of Washington. So I appreciate that the report begins to tackle how the U.S. could be more vocal in opposition to China's unilateral militarized efforts at the borders and further underscore the value for India of greater cooperation with the United States and the Quad, but to do so in a way that does not, as the report's conclusion states, trumpet the U.S. role in a way that puts the dispute solidly in that context of worsening U.S.-China tensions and the perceived effort by the U.S. to encircle China uh, and contain it. Um, I'll close here by saying, uh, as someone who's spending a lot of time these days looking at U.S. policy toward Taiwan uh, and that issue and efforts to deter and message the PRC on that admittedly very different issue, uh, I'm struck by some similarities here, specifically how there's a good amount of consensus on the need to better support Taiwan's ability to defend itself through material assistance, through intelligence, and so forth, but how it's much more challenging, I think, to strike a balance on the messaging and the public diplomacy side. That is how much symbolic or rhetorical support or visits uh, are useful to demonstrating unofficially uh, that the United States has Taiwan's back in the event of a crisis, thereby potentially adding to deterrent effects on China versus unnecessarily provoking Beijing and arguably backing Xi Jinping into a corner, potentially heightening a perceived need to demonstrate strength on this very key point of regime legitimacy and potentially making it that, that you uh, kind of are raising the risk of the military conflict you're, you're hoping to avoid and potentially moving up the timeline as well. So again, a long list of reasons why these are very different dynamics uh, with the China-India border issue, but it comes back to this overarching question of how loudly the U.S. should message support for India's standing up to PRC aggression versus just doing more to help India carry a bigger stick. So I will stop there and look forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Dave. Um, really excellent, comprehensive remarks. Uh, really appreciate that. And I'm glad you emphasized the relationship of Tibet to the India-China border crises. We do mention that in the report. Um, I didn't have time to go into that in my uh, opening remarks. Um, but you're you're extremely correct when you talk about the um, crackdown, um, China's crackdown on Tibet in 2008, and that's around the same time where China starts referring to Arunachal Pradesh as South Tibet. So there's obviously a direct relationship um, there. Um, so it seems there are, are many motivations um, to this uh, increased border friction that we can all agree is taking place. Um, I want to start by asking um, my own questions, take my privilege as the, the uh, moderator here to ask a question of each of you. Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Taylor. Um, so, you know, I think Dave has uh, talked about the um, impact. I talked about the impact of the 2020 border aggression that we saw from China. Um, you said they might consider it defensive, um, but regardless of whether uh, China considers it defensive, India considers it offensive, it has um, led to changes in India's approach to China and uh, in ways that China may not have intended or planned for. Um, you know, in, uh, China clearly does not like the Quad. And if its goal was to use aggression on the border in 2020, to kind of scare India away from working with the Quad, it seems to have had the opposite effect. So I guess my question to you is, do you think, what? Do you, how do you think China interprets this? How does China interpret the fact that after the 2020 border crisis, India then invites Australia to participate in the Malabar exercises, allows the US to refuel a P-8 in the Andaman Nicobar Islands? Um, how, how does China see that? impact of what happened in 2020? Sure, great question. So first, I don't think China was seeking in 2020 to send a message to India about the United States, right? I think it was seeking to send a message to India about the border, um, which is a very different dynamic. Um, and we can, you know, there'll be different views on this, I suppose. But on your the more important point, second point, right? Um, I think from China's standpoint, I mean, as Dave will, or, or for, for teeing off of Dave's, Dave's excellent comments, China's never going to sort of publicly admit, oh, wow, we really goofed, right? That was a big mistake. Um, but clearly it was a big mistake. And so 
you know, it, it highlights, I think, how China was probably fixated on one issue and didn't necessarily do the full sort of broad net assessment about what this might mean for uh, larger equities. Because uh, clearly, as you know, right, the effect was to kind of push India much more uh, or towards a posture of being much more willing to engage in some forms of cooperation that perhaps it previously uh, was less willing to do uh, with the United States. Um, and has led to the real, the, you know, the, the, the launch of the quad. And I mean, it wouldn't be a quad without India and so forth. And so in that sense, um, you're not going to find, <clears throat> you know, in Chinese writings, at, at most you'll see some elliptical references like, oh, the international environment is now more complicated, right? Uh, so, so but, but clearly, if you look at Chinese behavior, the effort to sort of uh, quickly put Gaowan back in the box, you know, in the summer of 2020 and calling for sort of a reset indicated indicated to me that that they realized they had uh, made a strategic mistake. Um, uh, but but um, so so I, I think there's that recognition. We see it with Europe and U Ukraine now, right? China realizes it like alienated uh, Europe too much. Um, uh, and, in terms of its sort of support uh, for Russia and uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, which is also kind of a strategic error on Beijing's part. And I guess last comment here, right? It should it, it should reinvite us to rethink how how much we want to sort of pro project strategic genius and long term planning onto China, right? Uh, to me, like these are strategic level errors um, in both parts of the world. Uh, yet China pursuing other interests either was willing to pay the price or did not fully um, um, sort of incorporate um, the price that they're now paying into their assessments when they were considering making these, uh, taking these steps. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Aparna, you said in your remarks that um, you had wished, I think the report spent more time focusing on what India would need to do uh, for, I guess, deterrence by denial or, you know, deterrence against uh, future Chinese border aggression. I wondered if you could um, expound on that a bit. And, you know, what are you thinking in terms of um, what India plans to do or uh, what it needs to do, what you would hope to see it do in the coming years? Um, thanks, Lisa. Uh, that's a tough question which you thrown back at me. <laughs> Maybe I should have been careful when I asked you the question. Um, I guess sort of, you know, I'll break it into two parts. What what I see India doing and what I hope India will do. Um, what I see India doing, um, unfortunately, is more of the same. Um, so, you know, from, I mean, the way I see New Delhi reacting to all that's happening is, yes, India has, India is closer, strategically aligned the United States, but it's still maintaining its autonomy. Um, you know, it's still, uh, while it is pushing back against China at some parts of the border, um, there is no desire to escalate it further. Uh, you know, sort of there is the belief that India will not sort of, you know, any, any escalation, India will have a disadvantage. And so India would like to manage the relationship as best possible through diplomatic, uh, primarily diplomatic means and signaling. Um, what I would like India to do is just three things, build its economy so it has enough money to build its military and third, purchase more military equipment. Uh, because on those levels, I, I sort of, I agree with the report suggesting that yes, this is something United States to, should do and would help India. I unfortunately don't see India purchasing that all the American equipment, high tech or others, which would help India because that's not been India's way of, you know, India doesn't really spend that much of money, doesn't have the resources. So that's how I would answer it, that, you know, there are things India will do, but they will be uh, primarily those which will send a message of signaling um, and diplomacy um, and say that, you know, unless you return to status quo ante, we cannot have a dialogue or a discussion. Um, and yes, you know, some sort of some intelligence sharing, um, uh, some, you know, some more troops on the border, but, but not more than that. And that's not what I would like India to do, but that's what I see India doing, unfortunately. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, and yeah, you bring up the point of needing to purchase the uh, capabilities that it needs to defend itself. Um, but there's been an increasing focus on indigenous production, co-production, which is happening, starting to happen um, 
the uh, consideration of the U.S. to co-produce jet engines with India is uh, a, gr a great milestone. This just happened in January. Um, but the question in my mind is, um, yes, you know, by all means, India should have its own defense industrial base, be producing its own defense equipment, but that's going to take time. And how much time does India have? You know, do, are there certain capabilities it needs to get in its arsenal now? Um, so these are the questions that that I would have as well. Um, okay, my next question um, is for you, Dave. You talked about um, building up maritime capabilities and how this is an important part of uh, the India-China competition. Um, and I think um, Taylor talked about the, you know, whether or not one of China's motivations was to distract India on the border so India would have to invest most of its budgetary resources into defending its land border rather than increasing its maritime capabilities. But from what I hear from um, Indians is that uh, what they have seen, the kind of aggression they've seen from China on the uh, border, it has actually motivated them to uh, invest even more in the maritime space and cooperate more with other countries with capabilities, um, more joint exercises, you know, more port calls, um, just, you know, any, any type of cooperation, maritime domain awareness um, initiatives. Um, so how do you see uh, the land border dispute dynamics impacting what we're likely to see in the maritime space vis-a-vis China-India competition? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I won't try to speak to, you know, what, what India will be able to do if it, if it dedicates more attention and resources to the border in maritime domain. I'm not as, as up on, on um, how India is going to manage those multiple challenges at once, as well as uh, Aparna and, and probably you. Um, but I would say, you know, I think coming back to uh, Taylor's point, I think on not assuming too much strategic genius on the part of the PRC, and this is a problem we, we often face when we're, we're talking about, you know, China's strategic aims. Um, I don't necessarily personally think that, that when China has been undertaking these actions at the border, it's been out of some um, understanding that to do so will thereby cause India to have to focus on the border and it will be less able to focus on um, building up its capabilities in the Indian Ocean. I do think there's some truth to kind of keeping India constantly on edge and having to worry about, you know, both Pakistan and, and the border and having to have that two front problem and that limiting India's ability to compete as, you know, potentially a peer uh, for, you know, for a kind of leading role in Asia. I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, but I think it, it, you know, I'm more of the belief that a lot of this comes down to some uh, strategic blunders. And I think, um, you know, coming back again to Taylor's point, you know, when we look at, for instance, uh, what China's done in, in Europe uh, as a result of um, its supporting for support for Russia and its invasion of Ukraine and the impact that this had in, in China's relationships with Europe. We haven't seen China actually change its behavior, right? I mean, it's continuing to support Russia. And if, if you believe what we're seeing out of the administration, potentially even considering stepping up support with lethal aid, um, what it's done is papered over and used, uh, you know, narratives and propaganda to try to, to reach out to Europe and try to, you know, convince them that it's that things are still good, and then, and then of course, use the draw of, of China's economy, such that it still is, um, to try to to try to ensure that that Europe doesn't, as a result of this, turn more towards uh, the United States and more of a united approach towards China. So I just want to make that point as well that I don't think that necessarily this all means, you know, maybe China sees that it made a blunder in 2020. Does that mean it's going to fundamentally change its behavior at the border? I don't think so. I think it means we're going to see a stepped up effort to to try to do what they're already doing, which is using this these narrative. Um, um, uh, mechanisms to try to change the conversation uh, in China's favor. Um, so, but just just finally on your point, I mean, I think it, it is, again, really important to think through uh, the Indian Ocean region impact and India's ability in conjunction with partners to be able to, uh, to be able to secure that region and push back on China's expansive military aims in the region, but also not just in the military space, what can be done diplomatically, right? Uh, we, we have heard for years about India uh, and its diplomatic approach to the smaller neighbors of, the, of, uh, of South Asia, even as China has been stepping up its own economic influence. And that I think is a really important uh, dynamic and needs to be uh, front and center for India, even as it is um, potentially distracted by what's happening up at the border. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna turn to audience questions.
Um, and I, I, we have a really good one from James. And I would like all of you to um, think about uh, taking a crack at it. And Derek, including you, I'd like to bring you into the discussion as well. Uh, so James asks, how does the growing relationship between China and Russia affect India's calculations related to its own relationship with and dependency on Russia? I think this is a critical question that everyone is asking. And so I'd like to get um, uh, you know, a couple points of, of comment from each of you. Um, so why don't we uh, go ahead and, and uh, go backwards? Maybe we'll um, start with uh, Derek. Uh, Derek, if you can chime in on this important question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a really important question, right? And so we just saw the uh, the you know the bromance between Xi and Putin in Moscow, right? And so I'm sure Modi and the rest of India is looking upon that as well. It's not maybe not so good for us, right? Because I think the traditional approach has been if we can be friendly with Russia, right, or in its former form, the Soviet Union, right, that will put pressure on China to behave at the border and for us to have a more pleasant relationship with the Chinese overall. And, and I just, frankly, I just don't see that working. Uh, in fact, you know, China and Russia right now uh, uh, are as close as they've been probably since Stalin and Mao back during, uh, you know, the early part of the Cold War. So, I, you know, we'll see what happens, but I, India's got to be nervous about it for sure. Great. Taylor, uh, do you have any comments? Um, sure. Yeah, I think, you know, the challenge, as I understand it, right, is from a military perspective, the Indian Armed Forces uses a vast amount of Russian military equipment. And that's not a problem you can solve easily or even in a short period of time, right? It would take decades to wean India from that position. And so in addition to other potential factors in which India might want um, uh, to, to maintain ties with Russia, it, it, right? Even if tensions with China grow, it has to think about force sustainment. And also in the naval realm, right? Uh, Russia is quite helpful to India. And so um, that, that is just like a structural feature of the relationship and 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 i don't see um it changing anytime soon and, and thus i think the effect of that on india's calculations will probably continue to be very important in the future um, as india decides kind of what to do great um aparna uh thanks um derek and taylor made good comments i'll just make one bigger broader picture one um, there's the world as we would like it to be, and there's the world as it is. For India, the ideal world would be a multipolar world order where India is one of the poles, and so is Russia and China, and everybody balances. And so Russia and uh, sort of you know can balance China, and so India doesn't have to worry about uh, Chinese dominance in you know in Asia and uh, in South Asia. And there's a world as it is where it's a weaker Russia and a stronger China, and India is still finding that that sort of, you know, trying to find that middle ground in how to deal with a stronger China when there's a weaker Russia um, at a time when India would like, would still like to maintain a strategic autonomy and not get too close to the United States or, you know, sort of, um, um, and, and, and I don't think it's found that, uh, that middle ground. And I think it's going to be very difficult for India to find that, that middle ground as China goes stronger. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Dave, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I would just add, um, you know, as we look at what's been happening with the China-Russia relationship, uh, particularly over the last year, but, but really um, this is a continuation of what's been happening since Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, is, is this dynamic where Russia is becoming the junior partner in the relationship, right? Um, which, you know, for years people would say, okay, China, Russia will never accept that, um, but now they're in that position and they really don't have a choice but to, but to stick with China, which is their, um, you know, main, main benefactor and supporter. Um, so I think that for India should be something that's somewhat concerning. Um, and I think Aparna kind of touched on this, but, you know, if when we think about, okay, how could China take advantage of this going forward beyond, you know, getting bargain basement cheap deals for energy, they could potentially put pressure um, at least is one theory, could potentially put pressure on um, on Russia to stop 
uh, engaging with with India in a way that's beneficial to India and helps to bolster its its military and could potentially be you know problematic for uh, for China in a in a in a future border clash. So I think when India thinks through the value of that relationship with Russia and the nature of the China Russia relationship, it should take that um, that that as a as a caution and it should factor into its calculations. Thank you. Yeah, I think you know some in the U.S. would say, well, gosh, if Russia is becoming more dependent on China, then will India be able to count on Russia in the future? And shouldn't that become part of India's calculations? But I think from the Indian perspective, you know, they see this growing Russia-China partnership and they're thinking, you know, how can we continue to keep a wedge there? And in order to keep a wedge, you know, they, they have to keep um, ties to Russia strong. So again, um, you know, slightly different approaches to the problem. And I think this is why the Biden administration, you know, has been willing to kind of accept India's independent neutral position as much as it may frustrate uh, people. Um, I think there there is a, an understanding of where India is coming from with its, its approach. Um, so we have another question that has come in from Aaron. Um, Aaron says, are there any nuclear non-proliferation concerns with these two nuclear armed states? Have you seen any leadership threatening the use of nuclear weapons during these disputes? Uh, so I, I see Aparna um, looks like she may want to take a stab at this one. Uh, Aparna, I know you've done a lot of research um, on uh, India's nuclear uh, uh, calculations in the region. So would you like to take a stab at this one? So um, I'm sure, you know, uh, Dave or Taylor or Derek may know more, even you, but sort of, I just have two quick points. One, um, the the threats part, I've seen more in the India-Pakistan, primarily the Pakistani side, um, you know, very few on the Indian side, but on the India-China, yes, India's nuclear weapons, pro I mean, in nuclear program, everybody knows, was a result primarily of China's nuclear program. So in that sense, one followed the other. It was India's way of ensuring that, you know, there won't be a repeat of 1962. But I've never seen any Indian leadership threaten the use of nuclear weapons, even in a campaign speech vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, sending a strong message to Pakistan is different. It's never been done in the case of China. I haven't really seen anything on the Chinese side, but I defer to those who know China better than me. Okay. Uh, Dave, Derek, or Taylor, would you want to jump in on the China calculations? Well, I guess I, I would just say, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything specific to China threatening nuclear attack on India. However, when India, I think, tested its Agni-5 missile, the Chinese criticized it and said, oh, that's nice. It's a dwarf missile that'll never, it literally said dwarf missile, uh, that'll never, you know, amount to anything, especially compared to our uh, our arsenal. So good luck, you know, little brother type of thing, right? So there's, there's like a, de, you know, the Chinese consistently have demeaned uh, India's, um, you know, nuclear advances. Dave or Taylor, do you want to jump in or? Uh, I mean, I don't have too much to add. I would just say, you know, I agree with Aparna, obviously, you know, we look at the history of, of the, the nuclear standoff in, in South Asia and China's role in, in, in Pakistan's program and how that led to what happened in 98 and all of that. I think that's that's that should continue to be a concern. But I think that China, from its perspective, in terms of what happened between continues to happen between India and Pakistan, does genuinely want stability. Um, and, and, and I don't think they I've seen nothing to indicate that they've threatened um, the use of nuclear weapons with their own dispute with India. Um, I, I just add that I think, you know, again, not, not not to come back to Russia too much, but I think China's been watching what has happened in the uh, in Russia's um, war with Ukraine or war on Ukraine. And the threats of nuclear use, um, and and the role that that may or may not have had in in the role of the United States in in, in coming in uh, in that dispute, and I think that China has potentially learned some lessons, and 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 that may apply that. But I would see that more in the Taiwan context in terms of the threat of limited nuclear use and how that could play in preventing the United States from getting involved in a Taiwan contingency, less so in in something having to do with India. I haven't seen anything uh, on that yet, thankfully. Um, I can throw out a wild speculation based on international relations theory, which means you should all disregard it. Um, so, uh, but I'm a professor, so I should invoke IR theory every once in a while. There's this something called the stability and stability paradox. Uh, 
which basically says when you have two nuclear armed states, you're going to see higher levels of conventional conflict. And it is possible, although this is a structural effect, I don't know how we would tease it out, but that kind of this slowly ratcheting up on the border um, could be a function of that, right? We have a little more confidence um, that you can aggress at the conventional level because you believe you've got deterrence at the nuclear level. Um, all that said, right, that's just a speculation. Um, along with Derek and Dave, I've seen no evidence that China has sought to sort of engage in any kind of nuclear threat making against India. And quite frankly, for the reasons that Dave might may disagree with with Dave, so I don't think China would, would do so in the future at kind of current levels. Um, but of course, it's a background condition and we should we should recognize that. And sometimes background conditions, their effects are hard to observe. Great. So we have a, a point of optimism uh, in this otherwise uh, sort of um, dire discussion. But uh, I also think a point or source of optimism revolves around the fact that it, it seems to me China and India have both played a helpful role in convincing Putin to stop his nuclear saber rattling with regard to Ukraine. It seems that both both countries have kind of made clear uh, that that's a, a real red line, um, which is has been helpful. Um, so uh, I have another question. Um, if, if the audience has more questions, please, you know, uh, go ahead and, and um, issue those. But but I actually have a question that I would like to ask um, the four of you. Um, so Michael Schumann recently wrote an article in The Atlantic, uh, which is quite interesting. And I think, uh, Derek, in fact, you were quoted in that article. But he has um, an interesting quote. I'll quote it here. The world is again splitting into two opposed camps, today centered on the U.S. and China. Once again, New Delhi is being pressured to take a side. And again, the Indians are reluctant to choose maddening U.S. policymakers as they did during the Cold War. My understanding, he, he when he says taking sides, um, he means between the U.S. and China, which is an interesting question because we've just been talking about taking sides on the uh, Russia-Ukraine issue. But um, do you agree with the statement? Do you think India would stay on the sidelines amid growing U.S.-China competition? So we, we've just talked about India's own problems with China on its border, but um, you know, to what degree will they associate with the U.S. in this larger U.S.-China competition? Or are they going to, you know, try to stay on the sidelines as much as possible? Um, uh, Aparna, I see you smiling. So why don't we go to you first? Um, three quick points. Um, what would India like to do? Stay on the sidelines if possible. Will India be able to do that? I don't think so, because in the Cold War, uh, sort of neither country, sort of, you know, neither the Soviet Union nor the United States threatened India's territorial integrity. Uh, the Soviet Union laid no claim to India's territory. Um, secondly, the world at that time was divided. And so you, you, the Soviet bloc did not trade with the Western bloc and vice versa. Today, China, I mean, if it's a choice between China and the United States, one country sits on Indian territory. Uh, lays claim to India's sphere of influence, um, has actually given military and nuclear technology to, to Pakistan and uh, sort of, you know, has given a lot of aid and assistance to all of India's neighbors and tries to wean them away. So one is a threat to India, uh, whereas the Soviet Union was never a threat to India. So India, in reality, India doesn't have a choice. However, what will India do? To the extent possible, it will try to do what I would say the, the Biden national security strategy, which is compete and collaborate. So at some level, you know, sort of push back against China, at some level work with the United States and partners, and at the third point also collaborate on, you know, when it comes to the global south, when it comes to G20, when it comes to you, to any of the broader organizations. So try to Try to the extent possible maintain a strategic autonomy, but it's going to get tougher and tougher as the Russia example shows India. Um, it's going to be difficult, but India will try to do that. Very well said. Uh, does anybody have anything to add to that? Okay. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it was very well said. I will, I, I will just point out, though, I mean, um, you look at, you know, India's relationship with China has deteriorated 
you know, significantly since Galwan Valley in 2020. The external affairs minister, Jai Shankar, keeps saying we cannot get back to a normal relationship unless or until that is resolved, right? Meanwhile, you look since 2017 after the Docklam standoff, U.S.-India relations have gotten much better, and they were already on the path to getting better for years, you know. So I, I think that India has already kind of implicitly demonstrated that we're more supportive of the U.S. than we are of China uh, in this great power competition that's intensifying globally. Great. Thank you. Okay, I have one final question, and I want each of you to, to take a stab at it. Um, so we posit in our paper, Derek and I, that, uh, you know, the, the chance of a conflict between India and China is growing um, because of these uh, increased incidents along the border. In fact, we saw just in December 2022, um, the uh, incident at to Wong, uh, we heard from Senator Merkley that the U.S. Uh, you know, was cooperating, sharing information and intelligence with India uh, to, to uh, deal with that situation. Um, what do you think we should expect in the coming, you know, say, one to three years um, in terms of the border issue? Uh, do you think that we'll continue to see these dust-ups? Uh, will we see something more serious along the lines of June 2020 in the Gowan Valley? Uh, could we even see, um, you know, a, a deeper, more prolonged uh, conflict? If you had to give your best uh, prediction. Um, so, Dave, I'll go to you first, given your former uh, hat as the National Intelligence mm -hmm. Officer for East Asia. Um, how, how would you approach this question? I mean, it's incredibly hard uh, as a question, and I think that that's why this this discussion is so important, just to try to help lend some understanding. I, I like how we all tried to dig into, uh, and the paper does this well as well, you know, dig into motivations on China's part, uh, which, you know, I think, as Taylor laid out, there are some very clear, you know, things we can look to in terms of what, what is motivating China. And as I think, as I, as I noted, I think we need to add that internal dynamic. Um, but from a you know fairly rational perspective, I don't think it makes sense for China to um, to try to cause uh, problems at the border anytime soon. The you know the, the uh, Chinese leaders, uh, Xi Jinping in particular, are dealing with a, a whole raft of internal challenges. Uh, most notably, uh, a, a slowing economy, dealing with a uh, you know downward spiral, as I mentioned, on U.S.-China relations. I'm really concerned about what could transpire uh, over Taiwan. Um, particularly in the coming year as we have a, a big election coming up in Taiwan in January. Um, so, so I would say, you know, if I had to make a guess, I wouldn't expect to see something like 2020 uh, again uh, in the next couple of years uh, because I just don't think it serves China's interests. But again, the caution always has to be there that I personally think a lot of what has happened in the past, and I know it's still not a terribly popular um, view, uh, particularly not in Delhi, I think a lot of it has been, you know, as a result of the PLA being given their marching orders to continue to gain and seek advantage at the border, uh, and that sometimes these are not uh, strategic decisions from the top uh, to undertake aggressive action. And I think we could, you know, see as a result of that, and as has been mentioned, as a result of these two sides coming into contact more often, we could see uh, another dust up. But I, I would, you know, I would guess if I had to, uh, that 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 would not happen because it's certainly not in China's interest to do so. Great, thank you. And if we can get just 30 seconds from the, the rest of you, we're at time, but uh, would love to hear from you. Aparna, do you have any thoughts? Uh, just one point. Uh, maybe we need to uh, sort of, you know, bear in mind what happens inside Tibet on the Dalai Lama. Uh, that's something David mentioned earlier. If things go south, then that could be sort of, you know, a reason for why China does things on the border. And you must remember domestic politics impacts foreign policy. So the more in sort of problems within, the more likelihood China will do something on its borders, whether it's the Indian or Taiwan or anywhere else. Thank you. Taylor. So I, I agree with uh, Dave and Aparna, terrific points. I would just add on the China motivation side, right? India and the West is a secondary strategic direction, right? It's not a primary focus. And so another reason why I don't believe there'll be um, even a Gawan style clash has to do with, I think partly maybe the lessons China learned in 2020, but also it, it is in ever more focused uh, elsewhere. And um, th that's another, I think, factor that would induce uh, some stability. Great, thank you. Derek, 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, not everything is necessarily about us, the US, right? It could be about China and India specifically. So yeah, we definitely need to keep that in mind, even though our recommendations in the report are about what the US should do because it's coming from a US perspective. So I want I, I hope everyone gets to check out the report soon. And thank you very much to Lisa for co authoring with me and to CNAS. And thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this has been an excellent discussion. Uh, really appreciate everybody's contribution. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the discussion as much as we have and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening as it may be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.